These words are spoken in the name and the love and the power of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well, it's been a tough week in Lake Wobegon. Tough week in the United States and a tough patch for the world. You know this, the litany is quite, quite difficult, but the Orlando shootings a few weeks ago and 41 people killed in that shiny airport in Istanbul where many of you have been, 22 killed in a cafe in Bangladesh where the so-called foreigners were separated out, and then 250 Muslims celebrating the end of Ramadan in Baghdad, and then, of course, this week in Baton Rouge and Falcon Heights and in Dallas. A whole lot of neighbor killing neighbor. It's hard not to conclude at one level that our world is more divided and more dangerous than it used to be. Certainly in the Middle East we have the Sunni versus the Shia, or some Sunni versus some Shia, let me correct that, and sectarian fighting. And Do you remember when you first heard the word jihad? The Islamic State has as its goal to divide Sunni Muslims from everybody else in the world. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is completely unresolved with no process even in place to resolve it. Christians are being driven out of the Middle East and assuredly there is a possibility that in Ben Thorsheim's life there may be no native Christians left in the Holy Land. In Europe, Belgium and France are still on high alert, rising nationalism. The Brexit vote, which was shocking to many, the seeming dismantling of the European project of unity, which two to three generations of people have devoted to building, ushering in a time of uncertainty. Russian aggression in the Baltics. And in Asia, a more aggressive China, a near rogue state in North Korea. And in Africa, the 10th parallel is a line of Christian Muslim fighting that does not stop. I looked up last night on my computer terror organizations in Africa, and 29 were listed. The greatest hits for us, Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda. And certainly in our own country, we seem to be living in a time of banner headlines, division, and some incredible demonizing rhetoric. Issues in our own country of black versus white, rich versus poor, immigrant versus native, Democrat versus Republican, Islamophobia, political rhetoric that not only analyzes it, but adds to it. So, into all of this comes Jesus. And Jesus comes to us in his teachings, and this morning his teaching of the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we read the Gospel from the middle of the aisle to remember that Jesus taught what he taught in the midst of the people. He was a man of the people. And we hear in this that Jesus, Jesus' teaching is responding to a man who is aggressive. He seeks to test him, and then after Jesus gives him a well done, he's not had enough, and he pushes his point, and it comes out biblically saying that he sought to justify himself because he was pretty sure he was right. And assuredly, this sounds like a lot of people in our world. 
The parable of the Good Samaritan is the most well-known teaching of Jesus. And that's a problem because we know it so well that it loses its power, right? It's like that other teaching of Jesus when he says, what happens when salt loses its saltiness? It is no good, right? And so with the parable of the Good Samaritan, we've heard it so many times that we have, we have softened the rough edges off of it. We have pretty much put it on the lathe of our consciousness and made it smooth. We name hospitals after Good Samaritan. I believe Good Samaritan Hospital is the most used name for a hospital in the United States. And who names their hospital after something that's wah, aggressive, right? And you've all heard, some of you, probably a hundred sermons on the Good Samaritan. And this is 101, and it's going to go into the trash can of Good Samaritan sermons about 10 minutes after I'm done. How's that for speaking the truth? (laughs) See, we already know the answer. Jesus gives us the answer, right? Everybody is our neighbor and we're supposed to love them. That's the answer, that's the teaching, right? Go and do likewise. So, how about this? So for at least before you throw the sermon in the trash can, how about we just spend a few moments and see if we can take a half step, one way to look at this slightly differently. So as you know, I believe that parables are teachings about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. That's what parables are. And the kingdom of God is the number one thing that Jesus spoke about, and we pray about it all the time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. On earth as it is in heaven. The first line of the Lord's Prayer is praise of God. And the second line, our first petition taught to us by our Lord is thy kingdom come. Now, a parable is like a Zen cone. The most famous Zen cone in the Western world is what is the sound of one hand clapping? And the purpose of that cone is not to answer the question. The purpose of that cone is to dismantle the way you think. And that is the purpose of parables, to to dismantle the way we think. They are to break down judgment. They are to teach us about the kingdom of God and breaking down our judgmentalism is really, really hard. Because we are taught to differentiate. That's what we do. That's what we get in our upbringing, our educations. I'm told that the Eskimos have 28 different words to differentiate snowflakes. So, These parables that are taught by Jesus just straight up assume that our thinking is too small. We're just too small. That's the problem with the guy who's challenging Jesus. He's really sure he's right. He's just way too small, right? So I'm reminded of Isaiah 55 here. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So I'm going to tell you what you're told in every Good Samaritan sermon, so just forgive me, okay? I'll do it really quickly, okay? The Israelites and the Samar- I mean, the people of Israel and the Samaritans were bitter enemies, right? They were considered apostates by the people of Israel. They disagreed over what was the righteous mountain to pray on. They disagreed over how to interpret the scriptures. They disagreed over the theology of the Messiah. 
And when you read the New Testament closely, you can see they disagreed with Jesus on a regular basis. You remember the story when they, they're, not, they're not cottoning to his teaching, and James and John, the sons of Deb Zebedee, are mad at them, and they want Jesus to call down the fire and brimstone of the heavens, and Jesus laughs at them. He laughs at them, and he calls them the sons of thunder. In other words, these guys are ridiculous, right? So, one of the problems for us is this Samaritan thing. So, the question for all of us is, I'm just take a moment here and a little bit of work for you. Who is your Samaritan? Okay, go somewhere inside and figure out the person or the people you dislike the most you distrust and you're getting close when you start to attach the word evil to them these are the people who you would never ever 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 attach the word good to okay so this is the parable of good fill in your blank so the teachings of Jesus are completely unambiguous The real question is, can we accept it, right? The kingdom of God is broader than every religion, country, and social construction. Thomas Keating, that great man of prayer, speaks about this, and he says it so beautiful. The kingdom of God knows no social, ethnic, racial, nationalistic, economic, or religious boundaries. There are no insiders, and there are no outsiders. Our Father who art in heaven is for everybody. And the teaching is really clear. Everyone must be concerned about everybody else, and that unconditional love is the name of the game, right? I was going to the Y the other day and fussing with something, and I looked up and I saw this bumper sticker, and it said this. Love all, serve all. I was like, dang, that's great. There's my sermon. Love that. <laughs> that's, the, that's it. That's the meaning of the parable. Love all, serve all. Now, the world has not gone to hell. It may feel it if you read the paper and the news. You certainly would believe that. The world is filled with holy people, and good people who feel the pain, who don't choose sides, who desire something better for everybody. And I don't know if you saw the story of the Good Samaritan in the paper and in the, on the news. I can't remember if it was this week, this past week, or the week before, but it is a Good Samaritan story because the man lives in Samaria. This is a Palestinian man who lives in the West Bank. And on the last day of Ramadan, he and his family got in their car and they were driving to Jerusalem. They wanted to pray on the final day of Ramadan on the Noble Sanctuary, which is that area in the center of the old city in the al Asqa Mosque. And as they were driving along, they came upon an overturned car and this man is a doctor, and he got out of the car. I believe he is a urologist. And he went into the car, and he saw what he thought to be the two parents dead and injured kids in the back seat. So he got the injured kids out and began to care for them. And while he was caring for them, he learned that the people in the car were victims of a terror attack. A Palestinian man, uh, ooh, a Palestinian, I won't assume it's a man, had shot these people. For the people in the car were Israeli settlers, and as you may know, Israeli settlers always settle on the high ground in the West Bank, in that area that Zionists call 
Samaria. And then he suddenly realized that his family was in danger because certainly the Israeli police would soon be there. And they would, he feared that they would round up everybody. So he ushered everybody away and he stayed to care for the children who were wanting to know over and over whether or not their parents were still alive. And then the Israeli ambulance came and the Israeli police came. And this man became something of a cause celeb because, as he said when asked, why did you do this? He said, it was the right thing to do. It was the human thing to do. And so, Maybe that's what Jesus wants from us. Maybe what he wants from us is to do the human thing. Because the truly, fully human thing is a divine thing. There's a thing about the teachings of Jesus they never go away. And we never get it all. And our choice about whether or not to be the so-called Good Samaritan is a choice that comes to us every day, almost every day. In other words, we can choose to walk on by, be a priest, be a Levite, and we do. And sometimes we choose to care for the person in trouble. And so the teachings are clear and the choice is ours. <laughs>